everyone, welcome back to the channel. So we're here with my Mustang Mach-E again, and it's time for an 18 month update. So there's lots to talk about, let's get into it. So my Mustang Mach-E, this is a 2022. I bought it in June of 2022, so I've had it about 18 months now. And uh, it's the standard range pack, premium trim, all wheel drive. So after 18 months, here's how I feel about the doors. I think the styling looks great. I kind of see why they made that decision. Um, they're trying to get a, eke out a little bit more range. It does give the car this nice sleek look. I think I just have a hard time believing they're gaining a significant amount with that considering how large the mirror is. When everything works well, doors open great. Um, the presenter is there. Um, so if you push in, you can't jam your fingers in the door. Um, so it pushes the door open this much and then you grab the handle, open the rest of the way presenter retracts and now the door is open. There is a physical button that actually physically moves to open the door, but the lock button is a capacitive button, meaning you don't actually physically push. Um, it's just a capacitive touch button. So it needs to be able to sense your finger there. It does not always work. You can see even right now it's not working. And now the door unlock is not working which probably means the app crashed on my phone. So I have the physical key now. I'll just put it in my pocket. Doors work fine. When you're using the physical key, when I first got the car, even the physical key was a little finicky, but over the last year, physical key, I've never had a problem. The doors always open and they always lock. Um, the capacitive part of the button still is not ideal. There's times where my finger's wet or the car's wet or because this little lock emblem is slightly raised off the plastic um, that part I don't believe is touch sensitive so it's almost actually better to to touch right below the lock your finger has more contact there with the button I think they look really nice um, I think the system is is really well thought out for sure frankly I just miss a standard door handle it's just so much simpler there's just a lot less to go wrong i still really like the interior of the maki -E. you know I, I think they've struck a nice balance here between having it look sleek a little bit futuristic but still being simple um you know for comparison with other evs the the tesla interior is a lot more bare bones especially the model 3 and the model y you you only have the center screen uh, you don't have any kind of gauge cluster screen. So the Mach-E does have the gauge cluster screen. Um, you do have physical vents here. Um, so you're not using the screen all the time just to adjust where the air is blowing. Um, you can also manually shut off the vents as well. Um, the seats are really nice. Um, they seem to be wearing pretty well. I've had a few other people sit in the car and that's usually one of the things they comment on is, oh wow, these seats are really nice. You know, they're they're cushy enough. You know, some of the older leathers I felt like were, were really stiff. Uh, my old Mustang leather was very hard and stiff where this one is, is a lot more soft, um, but yet it's still fairly breathable. Um, it's still easily to wipe it down if, if you spill on it. Um, you can see on the seat, you know, there's a few kind of creases and stuff from just getting in and out of it every day. Some kind of scuffing on the seat that you might be able to get out. I also have the 10 speaker Bang and Olufsen sound system. Uh, the design looks great. Have this really nice uh, mesh design, uh, integrates nicely here into the dash as like a sound bar. Um, looks great. Sound quality is okay. The mids and highs are really good. Um, nice sound stage, um, like it's well balanced. There's just not a lot of punchiness or a lot of bass or low end. Um, they're kind of relying on the subwoofer in the back, which doesn't feel like it's enough. Um, it feels like these side speakers down here could really use some more low end coming out of them uh, to make it sound a little more full. The back seat gets used quite a bit with my family. Still really like the glass roof on this. Um, definitely the back seat's the place to be to really enjoy it. You know, from the front seat, since you're looking out the front window most of the time, and, you know, it doesn't really start until back here, you know, where your head is, you know, you kind of have to look straight up to really see it. You definitely get some extra light in here, a little extra headroom. So it's definitely nice, but 
really the back seat is where you'll enjoy it the most. On the outside of the car, in the front, there are two chips, two or three little tiny rock chips just on the plastic part of the bumper. So the paint's chipped off there. Um, but I don't believe I've had any paint chipping at all on any of the metal parts of the car, um, which is great. There's also one little plastic fender piece in front of the back tire where it's secured with a metal kind of screw fastener and then a plastic fastener for the second hold point. And that plastic piece is broken off. I think I hit a box or something like that on the interstate at one point and that broke that off. Um, but all the other plastic trim, um, you know, around the car, on the mirrors, um, over the wheels, um, that's all been wearing really well. I don't do anything special with that. I just, you know, try and keep it clean. I'd also say the build quality on this car is really good. You know, if you watch any of the Tesla reviews, a lot of people like to talk about panel gaps. You know, for the Mach-E, uh, everything seems to have a nice fit and finish. The one exception is uh, on the passenger side driver's door, this piece doesn't quite exactly line up. This part of the fender is a little bit higher than where the door is, and there's a little bit of width here. You really only notice it if you're really looking at it, and from certain angles you can't even tell it's there. You know, the brakes uh, seem fine. Obviously, you don't need to be using the brakes a lot um, since you're using regen braking with the electric motors for most of the time. The friction brakes are really there if you're slowing down at a normal pace and the last couple miles an hour, the friction brakes kick in. Um, or if you're doing any kind of, you know, sudden braking, the friction brakes are obviously going to be used. You know, I haven't had any issues there. The tires seem to be wearing okay. So I want to talk about winter driving with the Mach-E. So the Mach-E has a few characteristics and things I hadn't really considered uh, when I was thinking about winter driving. You know, I kind of thought with the all-wheel drive, a little more you know, SUV style platform compared to a standard sports car, coupe Mustang, you know, kind of seemed like, oh yeah, this will be way better in the snow. Um, yeah, it's, it is better in the snow than a standard Mustang, the all wheel drive being the biggest part of that. But there's also some things that I, I didn't really know and it's not exactly perfect in the snow. So the first one that's, you know, maybe slightly obvious is the tires. So the Mach-E comes with uh, some Michelin all season tires great grip in the wet, you know, obviously completely fine in the summer. Uh, in slushy situations, it's okay. Some snow, it's kind of okay. But when the snow gets kind of packed down and hard or you start dealing with any kind of ice at all, the tires really don't have great grip and you end up sliding quite a bit. Um, and there's a couple other factors on top of that. The, they're skinnier tires trying to optimize range. Uh, they are low rolling resistance tires. So, you know, naturally they're trying to have less friction while they're rolling, which that's not great for slippery surfaces and ice. And being an all season tire, they're not ideal, you know, in those colder temperatures. So kind of all those factors together. Um, also consider the weight of the Mach-E. Um, you know, this is a heavy car. It doesn't really feel like a heavy car, you know, when you're in the summer scooting around because it's got great torque, it's got good power. So, you know, you don't really notice the weight nearly as much. The weight's down low, so even handling feels decent. Um, but when you're trying to stop on a slippery surface, it's not great. Also, it is all-wheel drive, which it helps a lot when you're trying to get going. You know, my old Mustang GT, uh, I did have snow tires for that car. Um, and in some cases, I kind of needed them if I was going to go up any kind of hill at all. The four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive on the Mach-E is, is great. I don't have that problem, it gets going. Um, but when it's time to stop, uh, it's, it's really no different than anybody else. So keep that in mind. Um, also, kind of a scary thing I found out last winter is when I parked on my driveway, the driveway had some ice on it and had a little bit of an incline, the Mach-E actually slid into my street. And I was like, wow, that's never happened with any other car that I've had in the driveway in the winter time. Like, what's the deal with that? And so I experimented with it a little bit and I realized that the front wheels were actually turning as it was sliding into the street and the back wheels were locked and sliding kind of like skis really in the back. Um, and so what's going on there is the front motor 
doesn't have any kind of parking brake or parking lock at all. And so the front wheel is just freewheel, even though it's an all wheel drive model. So, you know, if the front wheels could lock, when I was in the car, I did a little more experimentation. Like if I just put my foot on the brake, you know, now it's applying brakes to all four wheels, you know, the car stops sliding. So having two more friction points there in the front, you know, did make a big difference to keep him from sliding. But when you're out of the car, you're just relying on two friction points in the back to keep it from sliding. And like I already mentioned, these tires are not great on icy surfaces. The last thing on winter driving that I'll mention now is, uh, like I said, it's two motors, all wheel drive, but the back motor is the bigger motor. And so in a few cases, uh, if you're turning and you kind of step on the gas suddenly, you can get the back end to slide out like pretty far. And it can be fun if you're trying to do that or there's nobody around or whatever, but uh, if you're taking a corner or something, uh, just watch out for that. You know, take it easy on the, on the accelerator there because that big motor, it'll kick the back end out no problem. Now, it's funny because this car is as the Mustang name and that's exactly what a Mustang would do with rear drive. So it's kind of cool it has that characteristic. Also that rear motor in the back being bigger, that means when you're doing any kind of regen braking and you're slowing down using the electric motors to you know, help you brake and recharge your battery instead of the friction brakes, the rear motor does more braking than the front motor. And so you know, when it's dry surfaces or whatever, that doesn't matter, that's great. But on icy surfaces, slowing down with regen, I've had the back end slide around a little bit, which is a little unnerving because, you know, when the back end sliding around and you're accelerating, you know, that's a little more predictable. You're kind of a little more used to that, if you, especially if you drive rear, rear wheel drive cars. But when you're slowing down, you're not really expecting your back end to be sliding. Um, you're kind of expecting more like your wheels are locking up or something, but the back end kicking out a little bit uh, when you're braking, that's not a great feeling. I really think Ford should add some kind of snow mode to this. They could definitely alleviate some of that uh, with just a software update, uh, do more regen on the front motor or just reduce the regen in the back motor and heck just do more friction brakes in the winter time. I mean, the, the range is reduced already from running the heat. Uh, you know, the battery's cold. I haven't spun out or anything like that. Um, and the stability control I think will kick in there at some point. It will also apply ABS even in regen mode. It'll do the friction brakes to give you some ABS, but not a great feeling. So that would be great if that could be changed. Okay, so talking about efficiency and trips on the car. The car has 13,000 miles on it. And uh, I bought it with only 20-ish miles or so on it. So I've kept trip two going that whole time, um, have not reset it. Let me show you trip one first though. Uh, this is the last 2,000 miles or so, 84 hours. Uh, you can see this average says 2.6 miles per kilowatt hour. Um, and then you can see where the energy has gone, mostly driving, but still quite a bit of climate use. It's been cold. You know, this has kind of been uh, probably since late November until January now. So uh, a lot of cold weather driving there. This number, the, the efficiency number, and then the how is my driving numbers. I'm a little skeptical on how well that works and if it's really a correct number. You can see just we've been sitting here, you know, they're, they're, they're never this bad. So I think this rounding is, is working incorrectly. I've also seen this number kind of jump up and down and then uh, let's go over to trip two, and there's also another rounding problem on this screen. So you can see this says 3,182 miles, but it's actually because the trip can't go above 9,999 miles. So once I hit 10,000 miles on this trip, it rolled over back to zero. Um, now the hours is working correctly. You can see 489 hours. That's the amount of time I've spent in the car since I bought it. Uh, I'll, I'll do some math here and figure out what that average speed is over 13,000 miles, but obviously it did not take me 489 hours to go 3,000 miles. That would be really bad. Um, but you can see the efficiency number is the same, and you can see, you know, the little graph here doesn't really change at all between these. So 
I'm not totally convinced this number is correct for all of my driving. Um, I don't think it's way off either. You know, I think a good rule of thumb is probably a little bit of air conditioning, highway driving. You're probably looking at high twos to low threes, depending on your speed and good climate. And then in bad climate interstate, you're probably looking at high ones to low twos. And then uh, kind of add like a half a mile per kilowatt hour if you're in town to those numbers. So, you know, generally I think it probably averages out to something that's really not too far away from that. Um, you know, I'd like to reset this trip now, especially with this rolling over. I think it's time. So here goes nothing. There it goes. And uh, we'll check back on this in a future video. Um, we'd like to see how that ends up. I'm going to leave this other trip going just so we can kind of use that as a, as a comparison. So talking about the center screen, I still really like the physical knob on here. Uh, it defaults to your volume primarily. And uh, I really like that. Now Ford made an update within the last six months or so where it's not only your volume, it actually also will allow you to change your climate options. So let's say you want to change the temperature. If you click on the temperature, now you can adjust the temperature with the knob, which is pretty cool. Even the center of the knob there is getting more red or more blue based on the temperature. Um, it also works for the fan speed, for example. Uh, you can adjust that up or down. Uh, heated seats, you can adjust those across the three settings. Um, so it's really handy. Nice to see them doing a little bit more with the knob there. One other note on the climate controls is you'll see this button for air conditioning. You know, that's pretty standard in any car. Uh, but with an electric car, when you're running the heat, uh, you know, heat is a byproduct of the engine in a standard combustion car, but not in an EV. You actually have to run some sort of electric heat or heat pump or something like that. And so in here, uh, there's a separate button that allows you to turn on your electric heat, which makes sense. Uh, my only complaint here is I kind of wish this heat button, or at least some indication of if the heater is on or not, was actually more on the home page here somewhere, maybe next to the AC with a little light when it's on or, or not. In the summertime, you know, in, a, in an evening where it's really cooled down, or springtime in the morning, maybe it's 50 or 60 degrees, you don't feel like you totally need the heat, you just want to have a little bit of air flowing. Well, if your climate's set to 72 in the car, it's going to automatically enable the heat, which is going to use a little bit of extra battery. Uh, you know, around town, not a huge deal, but if you're on a road trip or something um, and you're just wanting to run your fan to get a little air in here and you just have it set on 72, it's actually going to be running the heater a little bit. Now, it's probably not using a ton of, of energy, but where you're trying to really stretch your battery on a road trip, it would be nice to know, hey, my, my heater is on and, and I could override that and turn that off. Uh, from the from the home page. Obviously you can go in here and turn it off, but it's not quite as obvious. In that same update, Ford also added this button up here that lets you automatically pull up the cameras on the car. Really love the 360 camera. Um, you know, it's it's obviously there's no camera on top of the car. It's using images from the side mirrors, the rear and front cameras, but very helpful when you're parking. Also, the ambient lighting in here uh, looks really nice. Uh, you can change different colors. You can also adjust the brightness and control all that on the screen. There's no option to make a custom color. Uh, there's some good defaults here though, and it looks really nice. Um, you also have some lighting here in the center, um, under the armrest, uh, underneath the tray down here. All looks really nice. However, there is no lighting on the door sill plates. My old Mustang uh, used to light these up as well, whatever color you had set inside. So talking about the gauge cluster screen, I, I do really like having this. You know, it's right behind the steering wheel. So, you know, all your necessities are right here. You know, you got your range, battery percentage. Uh, but I wish there was still more information here. And I wish it was customizable or at least had a few preset options. Th this is what it looks like all the time. I'd also like to see some more kind of nerdy EV type information like uh, what's my charge rate in kilowatts? What's my power output of the car? Like how much power is the car using right now? Even if you could just page up or something here, 
uh, just to go to a different preset page. That would be cool. Uh, you will get some turn-by-turn -turn direction information here, but you can't see what song's playing. You can't see a map of where you're going. It's it's almost too bare bones. It's, I mean, it's a full, super nice, you know, color display here, and it just feels like they could do more with this. Uh, I do wonder if over time, um, you know, Ford has really gone all in on, you know, supporting Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, and a lot of times that's what people are using in, in this upper half of the screen is you know, those systems, which work great. Uh, and Apple has teased some views where they will also do a car play of your speedometer and everything on, you know, kind of the gauge cluster screen. So I do wonder if Ford's just waiting to be able to enable that and isn't going to mess with anything else. Uh, we'll have to see. Also want to mention uh, buttons and physical buttons, especially for the rear trunk here, the rear hatch. Um, this button to open and close that, super helpful, but, and let's say you're about to get out of the car, you turn the car off, this screen is going to turn off or, you know, show some messages or whatever, and now that rear hatch button is gone. So if you're like, okay, I want that back, you know, give it back, it's like, no, no, okay, here it is, but if you had kind of, you know, turned off the car and opened your door at the same time, now the screen you know, goes into the shutdown mode and then it's gone. Um, so there are some physical buttons over here uh, for the headlights, for your screen brightness, traction control, max defrost. Any of those buttons, I would be fine to replace with a button for the rear hatch because there's so many times when I'm getting out of the car, open the door before I click it on the screen. And then really the only other option is to use the key fob the phone or the physical button on the back of the car. So there are other options, but they're all a lot less convenient than if you could just push a button here. All right, so let's talk about the front trunk. We use this for a variety of different things. Probably my favorite thing that fits really well in here is camp chairs. Um, for whatever reason, that's just perfect fit. Here's a different size camp chair, but obviously you could get four camp chairs in there, um, no problem. You do have a little bit extra space up above. Um, and you'll note it's also has a has a rubber seal around it. So, you know, water is not gonna get in here. You could also get a small duffel bag in there, 35 inches across, 15 inches, 14 and a half to here, 16 inches, but that's pretty generous, um, you know, this, this kind of crevice in here is about nine inches. There is also a drain plug in there. That's nice if you, you can do this as like an ice chest and it'll slowly drain out through there. I actually prefer to use it for like muddy kind of stuff like hiking boots or something like that. And uh, if some mud or whatever gets in there, you can either wipe this out or, or hose it out. So I don't end up using the frunk on a regular basis. I do enjoy having it, um, especially for any kind of trips, whether that's even just a day trip or you know some kind of road trip. It's nice to have the extra storage space. Um, it's also nice to have this area that can get dirty and is not gonna get on you know carpet or whatever inside the car. I've done some runs to Home Depot and I'm buying some mulch or sand or something like that. And, uh, fertilizer and just throwing a bag or two in here and not having that end up somewhere in the car. That's really nice. Uh, this is also where the 12 volt battery lives. You can't easily jump another car with this car. Um, if you remove this panel, you could get access to the 12 volt battery to hook up jumper cables, but it's not as simple as it is in a standard car. Great cargo space. Um, you've got um, a little bit of space underneath uh, the floor here. You could even lower the floor slightly if you want a little more height. I have my ice scraper under there. There's a little area for the charge cord. There is a 12 volt outlet back here. There's a subwoofer speaker back here. And then lastly, you also have this uh, kind of cargo privacy cover that you can install and easily remove. You can also throw that underneath um, you know, the floor in the back if you, if you want to take it out. That's nice if you're trying to, 
you know, conceal a few things back there. You can kind of get away with throwing a coat or two on top of it, but it's really pretty flimsy. It's not designed to have any weight really on top of it. And you also kind of have to watch out, uh, just for example here, you can see it kind of rubs on that. So if you've got something tall back there, it's going to s slam that cargo cover into that. So that's, that's not ideal. Um, also want to mention the Ford Pass uh, smartphone app uh, that you use on your phone with the car. Um, you know, I think uh, for a general app, I think it's pretty good. Uh, there's definitely a lot of great features. Probably my favorite feature about it is the remote start, and it's not relying on Bluetooth or Wi-Fi for that. Um, it's, you know, going through cellular to connect to the car. So you can start the car from really wherever you are in the world, but more realistically, I like to use it when I'm at the office. My car is out in the parking lot. It's winter time. Um, you know, I'm leaving my desk or whatever. I can remote start the car and the car can be running for several minutes before I get there and warm up. So that feature is really nice. Um, the app does feel like there's a lot of potential. Um, Ford can make a lot of updates, add a lot of features to this app, especially if you compare it to the other apps like the Tesla app, for example. There's really no options in there for setting what climate controls you want. Um, the car, you know, does figure out what you what it thinks you want and so far it's been right every time. It's always turned the heat on for me in the winter, it turns the AC on in the summer. So it gets it right, the cabin gets to the temperature you want. But it would be nice if you had more, you know, exact settings about that. Um, the app does have some helpful things. It'll show you when software updates happen. It'll show you when there's any vehicle alerts. Um, and you can unlock, lock the car. You can open the front and rear trunk. You can open the windows. Um, and so all that works pretty well. Really my only complaints with it are it's kind of limited. It feels like there's a lot more it could do. And the app does crash on occasion, which means if you're using phone as a key, which that app has to be open and running for phone as a key to work, you know, sometimes the car will be like, hey, key not detected. Or if you're trying to unlock the car, you know, just pushing the button on the door. If the app has crashed, you're kind of out of luck until you pull out your phone and restart the app. So I've always had phone as a key eventually work. It either works or it eventually works. Well, I think that's about it for the 18 month update. Um, hope you found this helpful. Uh, one topic we didn't cover in a lot of detail is charging costs. We talked about efficiency, but not so much the cost of that. Um, so I'm gonna be making a video on that. So subscribe if you'd like to see that. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.